Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ivan Rodriguez, your host and MC for the day, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Ernst and Young ESG Leadership Dialogues, where we will bring to you a series of six roundtables over the coming few months. This is the first of the six roundtables titled ESG as a Value Creator for India, Inc. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the motto of people, planet, and profit, with investors putting their bets on companies with high environment, social, and governance scores. It has been instrumental in reinforcing the importance of the ESG framework as a key approach for long-term business resilience, says the Ernst & Young report titled, can ESG help future-proof your business? U.S. data shows a record $27.7 billion flowed into ESG ETFs in 2020, more than three times the previous year. Globally, trillions of dollars are flowing into sustainable funds, with ESG funds surpassing $1 trillion in assets in 2020. In India, the market regulator is pushing for more stringent ESG-related disclosures amid rising investor interest. A series of efforts have been taken by the Indian government, one of which requires a spend of 2% of average net profits by India Inc. This is for certain eligible companies towards corporate social responsibility activities in eligible areas. The Indian economy is going through a phase of uncertainty coupled by amplification of several natural and social disruptions, making Indian companies rethink their business strategies. A look at how ESG creates value for corporates and their stakeholders, namely communities, customers, employees, government, investors, regulators, and suppliers is the need for all. At the moment, ESG may be in its nascent stage. However, with the shifting focus of the global economies to sustainable development, reducing carbon footprint, fulfilling beneficial social and environmental goals, it will make investors closely assess ESG and CSR factors in identifying their potential investments to have the desired impact. The ESG as a value creator for India Inc. Roundtable features a panel of renowned business leaders from different sectors who will shed light on how companies can identify and build the right value for their business with ESG as a tool. It is our belief that the words of wisdom from the respected members of this roundtable will help many peers to rethink and rework their strategy going forward. So without further ado, it's an honor and privilege to first welcome and introduce the members of this esteemed roundtable. Rajiv Memani, Chairman and Real, a Regional Managing Partner at Ernst & uh, Young India. Mahindra Singhi, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer at Dalmia Cement Bharat Limited. Philip Gaur, Managing Director at Brasim Industries Limited, Sashi Mukundan, President BP India and Senior Vice President BP Group, Tipali Goenka, Chief Executive Officer and Joint Managing Director at Wellspun India Limited, and Michael Holland, Chief Executive Officer, Embassy Office Parks. This roundtable will be moderated by Vinod Mahanta, Senior Editor, The Economic Times. You know, the virtual floor is all yours. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that every leader needs to have a future-proofing plan. It's a reminder that people need to think beyond profit. People need to th 
profitability is one thing, but planet and people are going to be an important part of the question going forward. That's why I think that ESG is going to be a very important part in the evolution of the business. And an important part in the journey will be how leaders learn from each other. With that thought in mind, Anson Young and EY have joined hands to create this platform. Uh, without further ado, I will jump straight into the discussion. We have with us Mr. Rajiv Imani, who runs one of, the, one of India's largest uh, risk technology as well as ELC practice. And he has a bird's eye view of what's really happening. So Rajiv, the thing is, and as the conversation on ESG has moved forward, has India Inc. now changed its view about ESG just as a compliance uh, exercise? Now, do we, now are the CEO's question, uh, questions changing for you? Do you think that uh, going forward, sustainability is going to be competitive rather than just an compliance exercise? Yeah, no, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Vinod, and thanks to uh, all my fellow panelists. I think it's a great, great panel, so I look forward to the conversation and thanks for participating. Uh, no, we know that I think ESG, as you rightly said, a few years back was a soft issue. It was a compliance issue. But now it's an absolute strategic priority for most of the companies. And I'm, when I'm talking about, I'm talking of here, you know, the listed companies will be the top 500, top 1,000 companies. Uh, and it is a key theme in the boardroom conversation. Any company that is looking at a plan, strategic plan for three years or five years and is looking to see how they create long-term value. For them, these three things are very important. One is obviously the impact of digital technology. Secondly, what's happening from a nationalism, supply chain, geopolitical, and thirdly, sustainability. Not necessarily in that order. It varies from company to company, sector to sector, but they cannot ignore these three facets. When they look at any kind of planning, uh, you know, when they look at their business plans in future. Now, the intensity could vary from industry to industry. Uh, for some industries, if you look at auto, if you look at power, if you look at energy, I think the direction is easier. Uh, uh, and for some of the others, the costs, uh, the investments and everything else uh, may vary. But the, the, the speed may vary across sectors, but the direction is absolutely in that. And, and most CEOs of progressive companies are saying we should be taking market leadership on this. And the reason for that is the financial markets today are disproportionately rewarding companies that are not only in, in the talking about ESG, but actually bringing it to life. So if you look at PE multiples of companies, uh, you know, whether it's from a societal standpoint, whether it's from a governance standpoint, whether how they're future-proofing their business from an environment standpoint, if you look at their cost of capital, if, they look, if you look at their ability to raise money, so, if, you know, if I look at Indian companies, they would have raised close to $10 billion just through green bonds. Uh, a lot of people who are exporting today, their customers are asking them the question. In a lot of cases, there is also the issue of traceability of supply chain. So the customers are wanting to understand what is, what is your scope of mission because global customers, and especially B2B and, of, and also in, in quite a few geographies, B2C customers are also asking the question. Regulators around the world, the governments are obviously very, very focused on this. And the regulators around the world are pushing this agenda very, very hard. So in India, for example, we have this new legislation, you know, BRSR, where it is mandatory for the top thousand companies. But companies have to respond to almost 140 qualitative and quantitative questions uh, around nine pillars. And, and they have to certify on that. It's voluntary for one year, but from next year, it becomes, uh, it becomes mandatory. And like that, you have an EU, American regulators are looking at something that's coming. The employees now, and in many geographies, employees in many companies, and I have seen some of them where, uh, you know, uh, how you treated them during COVID, uh, how you engage with them during COVID, how are you dealing with sustainability issues? What are the conversations you're happening? They are also important. So if you look at it from a Customer, supplier, employer, regulator, government, financial markets. It's be, and for the long-term sustainability of the business, uh, I think it's becoming absolutely critical. So, so you know, I think it's moving far at a very rapid pace and away from compliance into real in into the center of business. Sure. One thing that is happening, and I see that across uh, company, is that. Earlier, sustainability was a piecemeal effort. Now, companies are aligning corporate strategy and ESG. 
So the question to you, Mr. Singhi and Mr. Gaur is, how are your companies going, going about it? Would you like me to happy, take Happy afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, let me congratulate uh, EY and ET to take forward this important uh, aspect of the world, ESG. And good part is that EY of e, e of EY, E of ET and E of ESG is matching, merging together. I'm very thankful that, yes, uh, we have been included in this round table, which can really come out with some solutions, some understanding and some learning for me. Uh, I would say that our company, uh, Dalmia Bharat, is an 81 years young group working always on people, planet and profitability. And that concentration of thoughts has always helped our organization to think and work for larger purpose. And more pur specifically, if I talk of the cement operations, uh, you know, we focused in 2014-15 in a big way and created a vision and which was to be built, lead in building materials and to evoke pride in all, uh, all stakeholders through innovation, customer centricity, sustainability and values. So the whole purpose was to talk of inclusive growth to talk of equitability, to talk of sustainability, to talk of values. And I would say with this focus, one, we could look at the what's going to be the future. Secondly, what's good for profitability and what's good for profit, uh, with, uh, sustainability. And with this vision in mind, we created a business philosophy which says clean and green is profitable and sustainable. The good part of this philosophy is that we could inculcate the culture of sustainability and profitability down the line. We could engage people, we could engage all stakeholders that if you work on sustainability, it can enhance profitability. If we can enhance on profitability, work on profitability, it can enhance sustainability also. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the outcome of this is that in 2018, our company became one of the lowest carbon footprint cement company globally, as well also one of the most profitable cement company in India. Second outcome was that a organization CDP, which monitors environment uh, data and ranks the company globally, they ranked Dalmia Cement as number one in the global cement sector, which is working on low carbon transition. Thirdly, we could concentrate on various areas of not only conserving the mineral resources, but also supporting the society, but also adhering to the best governance norms so that it can give pride to all stakeholders. Now, the good part is that when we uh, identified certain social activities also, one of it was that how we can harvest water more than what we consume. And the target which we took in 2014, that we should be five times water positive by 2020. Good part was that we became five times water positive in 2018. And that also motivated us, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to target for 20 times water positive by 2025. Now, the purpose of this was that let us work on environment part front, let us work on social front, and let us work on governance front. Now, to emphasize on governance part also, you know, we were the, one of the first company which came out with integrated report. We were one of the first company who started now reporting on business uh, responsibility also, though it's not mandatory there. And in integrated report, we tried to access, we tried to highlight the six capitals, which includes human capital, societal capital, finance capital, technology capital, etc. So the whole purpose is that we have been quite successful in creating pride in all of our stakeholders. And I'm sure now the way our company has been looking at future, it, it has been able to make itself future proof. And that, with that purpose only, we could create a vision of becoming carbon negative by 2040. Oh, I am no doubt. I mean, I was going through the annual report and 
then dalmia cement has done a tremendous job in terms of carbon neutrality and water positivity so mr god if if you were to describe how is the journey of aligning aligning company strategy in esg how did you go about it how engaged was the board how engaged were the promoters in this yeah. i think like radeep said uh, esg is no longer a peripheral issue and in our state in our company it has become a part of the core strategy and there are three pillars of our strategy green products green processes and green supply chain and i think each one of them today have become a, a source of value creation we have been able to launch a, a, a eco based product which uses lowest water in the world so first thing we have done is got the enabler right today we make vsf at the lowest water consumption in the world then we we, we applied a blockchain technology to give an end to end traceability so if somebody puts a qr code on the garment made from a fiber he can understand that this garment is made from a pulp which is made from such and such forest in such and part of the world that is processed by such and such company and this company has been using all the ethical means so it is totally socially compliant so there are no no human right violation so we give it is not only about compliance it is also about reassurance so i think the transparency has become an important part of esg today so what we have done is giving a, a supply chain transparency to the end consumer we also have seen that the fashion industry is the one of the most polluting industry in the world second most polluting industry in the world it is not less known so we have built a technology where we can recycle cotton with viscose and we are up to 30% we are recycling and we launch the brand called leva reviva which gets a premium of about 30% for the normal product so what has happened is the green products has given us a premiumization opportunity so it is a good business sense i think esg is now making a good business sense the second part is the green technology i think we have developed you invested hugely because no esg can be done without r and d and we have spent a lot of money at the back end we have got a huge innovation cell where we have developed from a, what i called a, from a class to factory a technology for for a green fiber which uses a physical process does not do any chemical the factory i have developed that has no chimney so that's the kind of process we are doing so we are now getting into more greener technologies and i think you saw it today the yesterday the the nobel prize has been given to chemistry where the people have found green roots the physics nobel prize has gone to somebody working on the climate control so i think that is what the important esg is to the world today and third area like rajiv said is the green supply chain and i think what we have done by virtue of this blockchain by virtue of sustainable forestry by virtue of our policy that when we cut one tree we already plant three trees the forest cover in the countries we have operated has gone up from 80% to 125% we have been rated number 1 in the world in terms of sustainability by canopy and ngo now what happens all these things together when the jigsaw puzzle gets together we are now rated as one of the most sustainable companies in the world and we have been able to differentiate a commodity viscose into a good viscose which is sustainable and not so good viscose which is made by the bulk of the chinese producers and we are able to differentiate and create a value so to my, that is how we have been integrate able to integrate esg into our business strategy and the board is very because what we do is we have uh, re- renamed our risk management committee to sustainability and risk management committee which reports to board directly and the board reviews the performance every 6 months we have got a road map and we give them the milestones and we review with the board every 6 months and to chairman in the quarterly review there is a template where we have to show that there is a group vision on sustainability and how are we complying with that so i think there is a governance process and there is a, a strategy part of it and the two are converging to create value for the business that's that's about it. i think one of the one of the most interesting transformations that is happening in the energy space is how british petroleum or bp is transforming into an integrated uh, energy company i mean the B, the bp report actually says that sustainability is the foundation of its strategy even as the company is trying to reshape its um, its business so mr mukundan if you can take us through how a multinational is thinking about this whole esg agenda and bring it into the mainstream business thank you thank you vinod uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen fellow panelists Uh, it is indeed uh, actually an honor for me and my company to be associated with this uh, ESG dialogue. You know that itself shows, you know, you you are thinking about our company in a different way. 
And if you just step back about a year ago, I think it was February of 2020 when we came out with our new purpose and our ambition for uh, net zero. And then in August, we came up with our strategy, which was you know, based on the purpose and the uh, net zero ambition. What brought it all together was what we call aims. You know, we have 10, 20 different aims that we've come up with. The first five is looking at how we transform BP uh, to net zero. And this is around net zero operations. This is about net zero oil and gas. It's about halving the intensity of all the products that we produce. It's about reducing methane and it's about spending more money in new energies, which are you know, zero carbon. Then, then we came up with five uh, you know, aims to essentially support the world to get to net zero. This is around helping advocating around the globe. This is about incentivizing employees to start thinking more about uh, you know, net zero aligning associations that we you know, work with, becoming a transparency leader, you know, basically making sure that you know, we're transparent in terms of how we talk about sustainability. And then uh, you know, bringing in, working with uh, cities and corporates to clean those up. So you know, that's how we would do the net zero bit. Then we turn around and we said, you know, our purpose is about you know, making lives of people better and taking care of our planet. So we came up with another 10, uh, aims for that. And on the people side, it's more around, you know, sustainable livelihood. It's about just transition for people to, you know, to move into the new world of uh, transformation. It's about greater equity, uh, you know, in the way people are being taken care of. It's about enhancing well-being of our employees and the societies in which we work. It's about more cleaner energies providing that. And then in terms of, you know, care to our planet, the five uh, aims were around water positivity, making sure that our company is water positive, you know, in, by 2035. It's about championing nature-based solutions, you know, as we do our projects. It's about unlocking circularity, you know, in all the things we do. It's about sustainable purchasing, and it's about enhancing biodiversity. So, you know, you can see how these 20 aims are actually, you know, part of the, uh, the strategy of the company. You know, it's about taking the company from being a, you know, an international oil and gas company. We are saying now we're going to be an integrated energy company. And, and in, in doing that, we're keeping our sustainability goals in mind. And we're working all of this together so that, you know, it, it kind of becomes just one. You know, and this is why you will hear Bernard talking about you know, it's about, you know, it's not about profits and it's not about uh, purpose. It both can go together. Let me stop there. It's a very powerful quote with Bernard Looney has said, profit or purpose need not be a choice and instead can work together in service of all stakeholders. That's a very powerful way of run business. Uh, so in terms of, uh, if you see Dipali, you know, one of the things that you that Wellspun has done really, really well is basically injecting ESG practices across the value chain. And uh, you've done some great work in terms of farms and also getting farmers in, into the ESG fold. If you can take us how challenging that was, how difficult it was for a mature company to uh, you know, uh, change to that level. First of all, indeed, a pleasure to be here amongst all the stalwarts here. Um, and uh, definitely textiles is one of the biggest polluter after oil. And um, it's been a challenge uh, because the biggest landfills come in by textiles. Uh, cotton consumes maximum water, even while growing. So what Wellspun has done, actually, and I think for us at Wellspun, we want to lead the path for textiles. I think that's the goal that we have, and after Grassim, of course. Um, so, you know, we are working with farmers. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I earlier said, cotton, cotton consumes maximum water. We are actually have a project for better cotton initiatives, where we're not only teaching farmer better practices, how to grow cotton, we have AI enabled softwares for them to see how, you know, how to do farming well, their fair practices there. And along with that, um, I, somebody 
uh, uh, Mr. Gore spoke about the blockchain. For us, this is all going to be a very integral part because textiles is so complicated. The whole process is complicated. It's not just about the cotton that you're talking about. It is the dyes and chemicals. It is the other vendors who are in the complete ecosystem. For us, it has become kind of mandatory that we have a complete traceable solution. Imagine you have a QR code on your product and it traces it back to the cotton. It traces it back to the farmer who's grown that cotton. I think it's incredible. It's, it's powerful. And that's where we want to continue this journey because India is a cotton growing country. And I think for us to empower the farmers and the communities, I think would be very, very imperative. So as we talk about the communities as well for Wellspun, we have actually working for us, you know, uh, while, you know, we we talking about ESG today, it started when we started our Anjar plant in 2003, when we said that businesses have to be the agents of change, where we worked with the communities very, very closely. Today, I am very happy to say and announce one of our social businesses, Spun, has been recognized as one of the top 100 co corporate social businesses by World Economic Forum where women not only are getting their livelihoods, but also are beautifully crafting, you know, products, rugs and cushions, and they're going all over the world. And that is, and you know, it's always, you know, in India, it is all, I mean, and I believe being a woman, that if a woman is empowered, the child definitely goes to school. So that's where the farmers and the communities come into picture. So while when we talk about sustainability, for us, it is imperative that the world, it starts from scrapyard. You know where your rags are there, where your plastics are there. Imagine that plastic waste finds its way back into the packaging as a chip. Imagine the rugs that are made out of man-made fiber can be recycled and the fuel can be generated out of it. Waterless dying in your processes. I think these are the important aspects. And when you talked about cost, you know, circularity, you know, the rags that we, you know, are generated, they're broken into fiber, they're broken, they come back into yarn, and that comes back into a product. So, you know, the whole thing is a story that is beautifully woven. And one more important thing that we are doing is that we measure each and everything that goes into the product by a software called SOFI. So we can measure how much water is going into that product, how much dyes and chemicals, how much cotton, everything. So that actually gives us a measurement index. Um, and importantly, so very proud to say when everybody's been talking about water positive, um, 30 million liters of water at Wellspun is being, you know, all is being used, which is recycled, not a drop of fresh water is being used. So that the farmers are getting water for irrigation, and the communities are getting portable water. But I will always say, and you know, I think the important thing is about diversity again. Um, when you talk about social part of it, you know, the five trillion GDP that the country is looking at, if the 50% of the population won't work, it won't, it won't, it won't happen. So for us, we have around 30% women working in a workforce. And that was also an interesting anecdote I would like to share. We did a project with one of the NGOs, with one of the biggest retailers in the world. You know, how to multitask women, how uh, about hygiene, and also how to train their husbands and their partners so that they can share the workload as well. So, and it's not just diversity of women, it is also about the specially abled. Today at a spinning plant, we have the deaf and mute and the specially abled, you know, people working so that, you know, that also, you know, embraces the other part of the communities. And governance, of course, I think the governance is an in integral part of what we do because, you know, for us at textiles, it's a very complex supply chain. How does that all become transparent? So, you know, it is imperative that the governance is very, very critical, starting from the independent directors to, you know, the whole whistleblower policy, to, you know, uh, you know the risk, risk officer, all that is part of what we do at Wellspun. But I will still say, and I still maintain that the journey at Wellspun has just begun because there's lots to be done yet. Thank you. I think one of the most interesting parts of your 
program is the whole inclusion bit that you have added, added to the ESG. And that's something very unique. Uh, one of the things that Rajiv brought up was that people are ready to pay for, uh, or people want sustainable products. But my, but my question, and it's a big debate in the ESG world, are customers ready to pay the sustainability premium? So Michael, are customers showing preference for green sustainable building? Are they willing to pay top dollar for great workplaces? Yeah. So first, before I give my opinion on that question, I must genuinely thank uh, you for organizing this and for the esteemed members of the panel. Some of their stories are really inspirational. And I think uh, as uh, uh, the gentle Mr. Mahendra from Dalmia shows that Indian companies can, can lead the world in some of these arenas, it's, uh, it's really inspirational. I think we at Embassy REIT, uh, we listed in April 2019, about two and a half years ago. So we're relatively new in the public market sector, but definitely there was a comment earlier on, the drive towards ESG, I think is felt greater in the public sector because of the institutional investor side. Interestingly for us, you know, our customers um, are generally corporates. We rent business parks to about 200, often international tenants, not always, certainly often some of the best Indian companies who are working globally as well, leading in the technology sector. And all of that customer base, so that, that, that B2B customer base, um, have for many years been looking at the environmental piece, uh, particularly around energy and energy costs, um, as part of the overall procurement equation. What we've seen uh, in the last couple of years is that all of our customers or the vast majority of our customers are looking at the whole of that ESG equation. And um, as uh, Madam Dipali was, was saying, not just the, the energy environment, but also the way in which we all are responsible corporate citizens working in the communities that are around us. So I think, you know, are, are, are customers prepared to pay for that? Actually, I, I think it's becoming, in the B2B segment at least, it's becoming a, a, a non-negotiable part of the procurement process so that if the business that I lead does not grab this bull by the horns and, and ride it and run with it and learn about what best practice is, whether that best practice is here in India or whether it's internationally, um, we will be left behind because the very best customers, Indian corporates, international corporates, um, require that we're looking at all of those uh, components. So I think, uh, as somebody else mentioned, we're all on a journey um, some more advanced the, than others in this space. But I do feel that it's not really about is there a premium in terms of a cost and profitability. I think it's a sustainability issue, actually, that if one hopes to be successful in the sector, you need to, to lean into this space and pretty quickly get focused around it. I, I mean, one change that I've seen remarkably in the last only 12 months is, um, I think you asked me yesterday, pre-IPO, were our institutional investors asking us in depth about ESG? And frankly, the answer two and a half years ago was no. Um, in, in the last one year, it has become a key part of the conversations uh, with many of our largest institutional investors um, they want to know about the issues. The issues are important. And that will, as well, if you combine that with your customer and your stakeholder from an investor perspective, and of course, in our business parks, where there's about 200,000 people working in those parks, the young, I call it the, the 21st century Indian of today, uh, the young employees who are on those parks, they are also fully engaged in what we're all doing in that space. So I, I think it's a compelling um, proposition that we, we all need to get on, on the bus and, and, and ride. 
one of the things is uh, a lot of companies are talking about is transformation to technology will uh, will technology play an important part in whole esg roll up rajiv if you can share your thoughts on this yeah no no bro absolutely it's very critical i think we saw some great examples uh, already laid out so i think if you I and mean, it has multiple components to it when you look at uh, technology first is to achieve sustainability uh, uh, you know at least from our environmental uh, and uh, on from an environmental standpoint uh, you know whether it's smart logistics uh, whether you talk about uh, you know using of sensors and running the business more efficiently and everything or, or energy management i think technology is underpins uh, all that uh, you know uh, i think there was references both dilip and depali talked about you know uh, traceability sustainability Uh, the blockchain solution is is a prime example of how transparently you can do these things so that is one aspect of how technology the second is when companies are on their journey to to achieve a lot of the parameters are actually non financial parameters uh, which you actually don't get from numbers so you get these parameters from log books uh, from uh, you know control uh, control uh, uh, panels and everything else i mean if you have to imagine uh, you know uh, dipali talked about water you know if you have to collect information on that uh, it's not that easy so so companies are now trying to build out ai based solutions where you can you know pull out these information you take that out and then the next thing you have to do is find out what is your ghg uh, traceable you know what is the footprint ghg footprint that you have to manage that and to look at it you know <clears throat> process by process division by division department by department again to track that uh, you know you need a good technology robust technology solution around that and then you know the if you take that further and say okay if i have to do analysis and if i have to set kpis for my management teams and others how do you escalate that down track that down both financial measures non financial measures so lots of technology tools softwares in fact if i look at the microsoft the saps of the world and some other boutiques there's almost a race to say you know how do we build this comprehensive uh, platform then you 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 go further and you say that companies are now trying to do deep analytics some of them are building cloud based solutions to say okay how do how does our uh, solution uh, or what we are doing compare Uh, with what the others are doing, so there also you know uh, the analytical co- comparisons, what companies are doing, uh, how they are measuring this, how they are comparing them uh, with the others, what's their maturity assessment. There also one is seeing uh, technology. Then uh, you know the the regulators are becoming much more tighter, so you need certification, you need this thing, and unless you don't you know for someone at the board or the managing director or chairman to sign or or auditors to sign something. you know unless you don't have a very thorough way through which this number comes out that's also a challenge and finally we know what i'm also interesting be seeing is people are in some industries people are converting this into a competitive advantage for example you know there was a the pali mentioned you use the qr code and you figure out you know where the farmer is you some credit card companies are saying that you do the spending and you will figure out what my carbon footprint is obviously you need big data lakes Uh, uh data warehousing to to do some of these things but they also translate into competitive advantage so technology is one of the main reasons why sustainability is going to accelerate why it becomes a much stronger commercial proposition as compared to where it was earlier is because of what technology enables it to do it will be great to have some industry view on view on this Uh, how technology is used is being used to drive the ESG agenda. If uh, Mr. Gaur, Mr. Singh, you would like to share your thoughts. Sure. So first, I would say I would uh, echo all the thoughts which uh, Rajiv ji has shared because uh, whatever sort of IT which is playing very important role, whatever enabling these technologies will help in you know tracking the data, analyzing the data, and to act. but i would say technology is one of the enabler but the most important for esg which we have seen its implementation is the mindset and the vision so with this mindset and vision i think we have been able to visualize technology not of today but of tomorrow and that helped us to venture for some new uh, aspect of technology which is one how we can use less 
uh, mineral resources and use more waste of other companies like uh, other sectors like uh, flyers or power plant or slag or steel plant and can also break down one the usage of right material at the same time how we can also bring down our power consumption also so technology there has played very important role in developing the right quality of material secondly we have been also looking at what new technology which may come in and one of the important uh, technology which is of course is nascent stage is how you can capture carbon dioxide and then use it today carbon dioxide is being considered as a waste material but we are trying that how this waste can be converted into wealth so technology is playing very important role even in how we can use waste material of uh, chemical plant of automobile plant of uh, pharmaceutical plant to replace fossil fuel by these waste and one more technology which we are now exploring is how we can create more renewable biomass so like planting bamboos and then how with the right technology you can use it as a replacement of fossil fuel so technology would go on playing very important role and once you have the all sort of technology which can also reassure the quality of uh, cement so that would help in a big way one of the major initiative which we have taken and then have uh, committed publicly is that with the support of technology we would be manufacturing only blended cement from 2025 this is a bold commitment which we have done publicly with the support of technology also and with an uh, guidance from our board that we have to be carbon negative by 2040 but at the same time there has to be very specific road map that by 2025 where would would reach by 2030 where would reach so uh, i'm sure the new technologies which would be coming up one on renewable energy part that how solar panels can be more efficient so that it uses less uh, space and uh, generates more power how uh, from the waste hot gases of the cement plant you can generate about 25 or 30% power used for the cement plant so these are the few technologies which will help in addition to various it technologies which will be helping the management thank you i just to uh, to add on to from what mr singhi said i think i believe uh, technology and esg have a virtuous relationship one leads to the other other leads to the support like if esg is the biggest source of innovation i believe so if you look at what happened to solar power 10 years back it was 20 rupees a unit today we are getting at less than 2 rupees and that's what technology can do and i think uh, and that is how the esg is driving a new way of doing business new way of thinking what circularity i i mean the other area where i think the the waste of one industry becomes a raw material of the industry so i think what is required now for technology to look across industry so far we have been looking among our own four walls of the industry so like a cement and aluminum the red mud which can be become a feedstock for the cement is a huge opportunity millions of tons of red mud which is going into the landfill and a, and a huge source of contamination is getting into raw material but the biggest challenge with technology has to address in esg is coal india has 74% fossil fuel from coal energy and unless we find a solution to that i don't think we will be able to meet our net zero targets and the and the, what we have done in solar has to be done in case of hydrogen today hydrogen is 8 dollars a kg we have to bring the price to less than 1 dollar a kg and that is what the next phase of technology has to happen and i believe once you look across the world so what will happen technology follows from scale you so we will have to look for a solution cross border we will have to integrate the demand of the entire world and then start working on a technology so it will require a collaboration way beyond the geography it won't be limited to an industry or to a country so to my mind a decarbonization uh, project a hydrogen economy has to become a global platform and we need to do on a platform research in our own way i think the third area is which i mentioned in my earlier this thing is the green technology i think the one of the big signs which will happen is, is going to low energy processes and i think every industry is not is now getting into the process that they use less energy and the problem is where the products have carbon dioxide in it 
then what do i do and that is where the carbon capture will become an important part of the technology there are certain products you can't do without carbon dioxide so they there what singhvi ji said i think carbon capture will become a major thing what i would suggest as a as a responsible industry and a responsible uh, member of the global fraternity we must develop a blueprint for technology for the esg sector and i think we have seen the easy part of the uh, of the journey the tough part is ahead of us and that is decarbonizing the coal and finding a solution to the coal problem but i am sure we will reach there i think an important part of the evolution will be basically um, how much r and d we do in terms of research and development the, the size and the scope of r and d uh, if mr mukundan you can share your thoughts about how vp is going about it and i'm given the scale of the transformation that it's undertaken thank you vinod i think um, the way to think is you know i would look at it in two dimensions right one is around the uh, you know the technologies that are being used when as we you know pivot from conventional energy towards zero carbon energies right whether it's solar you know wind offshore wind you know hydrogen all of these are requiring new technologies and these are all technologies that are being developed as we speak and then in your existing stuff like natural gas you know you're looking at ways to clean it up through carbon sequestration you know you convert it into hydrogen and then you sequester the carbon or you use the carbon in various ways so all of these are new technologies which are coming up but another dimension that i think about in addition to technology is about scaling because one of the key areas that we need to think about as we transition and as things are changing and with digitization taking over you know rajiv talked about how you know you're getting more and more digitally savvy and how that is going to drive energy efficiency that's going to drive the way we deliver solutions to customer that's the way you know customers will expect us skilling becomes important and skilling needs to be done all the way from grassroots level so i'm mean, an example i'll give you is you know we we are currently skilling roadside mechanics you know who who work on motorcycles to work on more modern motorcycles and also look at working on uh, you know ev based uh, uh, motorcycles you know so these could be you know your ev scooters so you know what you're doing is you're taking them from where they are and you're kind of you know as you would you talk about just transitioning them to the new world same thing you know uh, we're looking at on the energy space where we're working with university so we're working with iit bombay we're working with iim ahmedabad to look at ways to you know how do we get people more skilled how do we get entrepreneurs to start working on newer ways of delivering things and and you know improving their own skills so you know it's a combination of both you'll have to build the skills you'll also have to come up with new technologies and you know and this is uh, you're right i mean it's going to take a lot of work we're actually setting up a um, digital innovation and ai based uh, solution hub in india in pune because we see huge talent in india that can work on this we are hiring close to 2000 2500 people to work on this and this will change the way we think of low carbon the way we look at you know delivering energy to the uh, customers how we improve our own you know uh, operations you know, we talked about all our 10 20 aims they will be sitting and helping us think through this stuff so it's bringing a different mindset to the company taking away the old oil and gas thinking bringing the more customer centric you know how do we deliver these things so you know it's a combination of both sure technology is one part but a key and a key important part of every transformation is basically how do you change the company systems and processes um i was reading the annual reports and two complete two uh, two things really stuck out one was basically the abg sustainable business framework and another framework which was it was in in the in the well spun report and if mr gaur you can take us through the framework and how you how you roll it out how, what kind what part is how does it how is it executed that will be a great help the abg framework has started from the vision with mr birla uh, kind of spelled out maybe 10 years back 2012 and it was very simple br- uh, brief that every business has to be a, a global leader in sustainability in their 
part of the business simple so it first started with a benchmarking and i think and then we all built up a road map so each one of us built up a 5 to 10 years road map that how will i get the global leadership in my own business i mean when i i came into this job in 2016 and they, they we were nowhere in the in the packing order for the for the sustainability but fundamentally the, the once the north star was very clear that this is where we have to achieve and we have we had a very discrete action plan and milestones and we have a system every year we have got what we call a planning and budgeting meeting where we where we do a one year form plan and two two to three year rolling plan and we kept we keep revisiting and there is one section on that on sustainability which is presented to the chairman and that road map keeps on updating the road map where we are what are the slippages what can be done better how what has worked well what has not worked well and then that road map is presented as a part of sustainability and Uh, and this management committee to the board once in six months, and every quarter review there is a template for all the companies, a standardized template which is prepared by the group sustainability cell, which follows the uh, the the framework. So that the template is presented to the chairman every quarter. So that's how the monitoring happens. But fundamentally, I think what has happened is we all have I because the end point was clear, we the path was not clear. So we all have. found different paths to reaching the, the same goal and what we did for us we did faster than other people today if you go to the, the to the uh, man made solid fiber industry we are the undisputed number one we have been uh, ranked number one globally for last 3 years in succession on the on the circular economy we have got the global leadership in terms of the for our for our brand in terms of for, for global brand so i think uh, the the clarity of end point and a uh, uh, rigor in the monitoring is what helps you achieve this to my that there are two simple things sure dipan you know i think the important aspect of when we talk about technology um and uh, sustainability i think uh, esg is the new new technology and uh, they go hand in hand and uh, for ex- and uh, definitely i think technology is an enabler and um, uh, for us at wellspun i think the important aspect is to see the end to end supply chain the iot and the robotics and how do we work out our warehouses and for us the supply chain itself is so complex so technology is bound to you know impact imagine all your machines on one platform so you can react faster you, your utilization of steam is lesser so i think those are the aspects that definitely also a part of what manufacturing can enable to and of course i spoke about blockchain earlier but i think fundamentally i think skilling is a very integral part of what we can do today um digitization we all saw in covid how how the whole acceleration happened of digitization and i think and that's where we we got into the whole upskilling of our teams who have the domain knowledge but then they have to be upskilled so we have this wave academy which is upskilling our people for the new ways of doing e-commerce and new ways of doing businesses uh, manthan manthan is a innovation is a program where we encourage our blue collar associates to give their you know their ideas and believe me till now they we've already had have had you know last month we had around 500 bright ideas that already have come in from them there's another program that we have is disruptors which is in the communities and the colleges so you know the the ideas again are like and it's like a startup investment that we are doing so that encourages the encourages the whole ecosystem um so i think technology skilling i think these are very very important aspects of how to move forward and definitely i mean and it's again the culture culture so i i can tell you that all of us all our apex teams are going to there you know the as we're going to be evaluated 20% is going to be evaluated on the esg uh, you know kind of implementation by the leadership teams so definitely that's where i would just uh, you know say that uh, they all go hand in hand because remember culture eats strategy for breakfast so yeah for sure a, pr- a promoter question to you one of the biggest debates or one of the largest fights that happen within a company regarding sustainability is the whole the fight between the finance department and the sustainability department and the whole irr argument which comes up how do you make both teams sit together and work through this believe me i think everybody sees merit i haven't seen that happen at wellspun 
I'm being very candid about it because I think if we all are aligned towards one goal, and that is to make the most sustainable company in the world, and to run it, and I think, and I think we've seen a lot of examples where Mr. Gore and everybody as well here, that you know when you when you talk about sustainability, it can't run in isolation. It has to be a profitable initiative. It has to also coexist together. So definitely, I think everybody sees merit. And of course, now there are these green bonds. There's a lot of kind of you know kind of opportunities for companies to really make that difference, you know, with their competitors. And the competitors are going to fall back, and that's what our finance team definitely understands. So yes, so I think everybody needs to coexist together, and that's what it would be. Um, I have to actually. I'm sorry. I'm just intervening. I will have to leave in another five minutes. I have a conversation uh, with uh, you know the minister after that. So sorry to. Uh... That's not a problem. Mr. God is smiling. I think he has something <laughs> to say. No, no. I, I'm I'm in mean, fully agreement with what Mr. Pali is saying. I think that's perfect. <laughs> okay. One of the things that the, that we'll have to work through is the whole regulatory aspect to it. Um, there's a lot of lip service uh, paid to ESG, but not much has done. Rajiv, you can share about where do we stand on the, the regulatory aspect and what more needs to be done basically to drive this ESG agenda um, further. Yeah, no, no, you know, I think the government, if I actually see, has done quite a bit. Mr. Dushan, Hello, sir. Mr. Dushan, why didn't you send this letter, right? Did you have a 1.5 commitment? You need to face out court. You need to be behind this. So let's uh, hold ourselves accountable. I'm happy. Yeah, if there's any question. Singiri, can you be on mute, please? Um, Thank you. So, so I think uh, uh, you know, I think the, the the government has actually done a lot. I mean, the first thing they did was really to set their aspiration, and and what they've said, for example, is that by 2030. Uh, as compared to in 2005, the emission intensity in the GDP has to come down by almost 33 to 35 percent. Uh, 40 percent of the installed uh, electric power base has to be from non-fossil uh, sources. Uh, if you look at the the uh, the carbon sink that they want to create uh, by enhanced forest and tree cover, is almost to the extent of uh, uh, you know two and a half to three billion tons of carbon dioxide. So I think if you look at that, and then if you look at, look at the policies below, uh, so first thing is obviously, I mean, which uh, I'm sure Sashi and others uh, don't like, but petrol and diesel are taxed at the highest rate in India. In some ways, they act as disincentive. I mean, the tax rate, if you ask, add, add central and state, it's almost more than 100%. Uh, now, that's and as compared to uh, the non-sort of fossil fuel, it's where the rate is is, is almost 18%. So I think that acts as a, this thing. If you look at coal, coal cess, that's almost, uh, you know, uh, 400 rupees, uh, 400 rupees a ton. That's there. Uh, you know, in some of the states, there is a green tax when you are selling old motor vehicles and others. So, so uh, you know, both at central and state level, uh, these policies are there. Uh, if you look at uh, depreciation rates, normal depreciation rates are 15 percent. I'm talking about fiscal depreciation. Uh, for for items which which have been controlling air pollution, controlling water pollution, uh, for renewable energy and everything else, the fiscal rate of depreciation uh, is almost forty uh, percent. Uh, so if you look at the entire scheme, we know of the PLI schemes. Uh, you know the automobile PLI that is there, which is almost an allocation of twenty five thousand crores. That entire you know a large part of that is also for encouraging green uh, and electric. Uh, uh, hydrogen and electric uh, uh, batteries uh, uh, production. If you look at the uh, the PLI scheme, which is there for uh, manufacturing of solar equipment, that is almost 5,000 crores. The uh, 18,000 crores is allocated for battery and everything. So a large part of PLI is also directed towards uh, areas of manufacturing, which lead to a greater level of sustainable uh, economy. The FAME 2 policy, which is to encourage commercial vehicles, uh, you know, there also the government has allocated almost 10,000 crores. Uh, so that's that's there. Uh, if you look at the hydrogen mission where they want to encourage the use of green hydrogen, I think the finance minister announced in the budget, the, the prime minister announced that in this year's 15th August uh, speech. So that is also there. The scrappage policy, I think there was something today 
uh, in the in the economic times and other newspapers also uh, you know many many uh, are following aggressively i'm speaking on the cards for a long time but the scrappage policy is also uh, is being pushed hard then you have at least 8 to 10 different missions uh, you know you have the national solar mission which talked about uh, you know for for uh, you know uh, achieving uh, certain uh, till 21 22 almost i think 100 gigawatts of this thing uh, then you uh, looked at natural uh, uh, you know national uh, uh, water mission which talked about much more of uh, water so either 8 to 10 there's in, including one mission which is on strategic knowledge uh, for building strategic knowledge on climate change uh, there is one for energy a mission for energy efficiency one mission for enhancing forest cover and everything else uh if you again look at the this year's budget the closure of some of the old power plants the change to electricity act so i mean i can go on and on but if i look at the number of things especially in the last 3 4 years for last 5 years that the government has effectively done uh to 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 take the direction uh towards getting more and more sdgs into the policies into the formulation and various programs that they are rolling out actually it's quite significant and i think of it through cop when when the next cop happens i think some of this you know some of them will further come through sure. mr singhi and mr god what change would you like to see in policy to to drive esg agenda further i i would say one government is quite proactive on pushing this esg concept because it's augurs well for the indian economy also because the companies who would be scoring high on esg marks they will be able to attract lot of uh, global investments also and at the same time the government is also now trying to ease certain policies like what mr rajiv memani has said this is in regard to renewable policy uh, energy policy in regard to electric vehicles in regard to how the uh, green product can also be uh, pushed up now i think one which i would like to recommend to the government would be that they should think of now well in advance about the green product procurement policy in fact in 17 countries including the first one was the california state which came out with a green product uh, procurement policy so that uh, those uh, production of the low carbon products can be encouraged so government should come out with that policy second i would say quality uh, to pay policy should come in Uh, the, the moment this polluter to pay policy comes in i think the waste problem of the country can be solved in a big way and cement sector per se can be one of the big enabler to take care of the waste and, and third uh, i would say that in uh, texas and uh, arena also how those uh, esg companies get be treated in a different way because important is that let esg be the esg of the person now by understanding the esg of a human being we can understand his heart feet everything similarly this esg of a company can be understood and then accordingly uh, government can play the role thank you mr god yeah sorry see uh, i have only one observation to what uh, sangeet ji is saying see every country is on a esg journey and the pace of esg uh, adoption is different now what is happening is is a global world so so we get feedstock raw material from all parts of the world and there is a company in india who is very esg uh, focused and who is doing everything which is which has to be done to comply there is a country in south east asia who doesn't care who is deforesting and makes a cheaper product and send them same country i think the government has to understand that they provide a level playing field in terms of through this some kind of a protection to people who are very esg conscious today there is no consideration given european union is first time talking about the border tax i am not saying do a border tax i am saying there must be a a baseline uh, stipulation that we have committed to sdg 15 14 13 12 anybody not complying with that should not be allowed to export into, into this country i am not saying put a monetary barrier it should be a go no go gate and that is something which i think will incentivize the indian industry to move at a faster pace on esg 
And the second, I have been saying the R&D for decarbonization will require a lot of support from the government. I think we need to put up our act together there. Sure. Michael, going forward, do you think that ESG will be a value driver in real estate? Or can better regulation help? I, I think what's happening, and I speak about commercial real estate, which would be industrial and offices and so on, not the residential side. But even in that space, I think it is becoming something the 21st century customer is looking for. So I was reading the report from, I think it was Mahindra Life Spaces a couple of days ago. Fantastic to see what they're doing. And clearly their product is, is residential. In the commercial and industrial space, as I said before, I, I think it's a lot of what's been said on the panel. It's about the investors will drive it, the consumers, which is corporations. And as Mr. Gore says, our customers, we now operate in a global world. Our customers um, are, are international, our suppliers sometimes are international. And I think that everybody of any stature and responsibility who wants a sustainable and profitable business over the coming decades, just like Mr. Gore mentioned, you know, you start in 2016, it takes a number of years. And I know Mr. Singhi started many years ago with Dalmia. It takes many years to change some of these challenging things about your supply chain, the way in which you do business and so on. But um, bringing that culture into your business um, it, 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 every, I think it's clear now, and as um, uh, Madam Dipali said, actually, when we have set out our strategy and we're preparing our roadmap, there's no pushback from our finance team. They want to be part of that journey just as much as our governance team, our human resources team. Um, our operations team. I, I think we all know, uh, responsible individuals all know that this is a required path for business and also just for our general lifestyle for our, for our future generations. So um, is it a value driver? I think without it, uh, you're not going to become an industry leader in whatever sector you're looking at. I think I've just run out of time. One last question to Rajiv. Do you see sustainability as a business opportunity? Can India be a supplier of people, knowledge, technology to the world? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, uh, for sure, uh, yes, you know, because I would say, you know, if you look at, I mean, if you look at EY, and I don't think we're in this one, you know, our purpose and purpose of a lot of organizations are bearing around that is to build a better working world. Our ambition is to create, uh, you know, long-term value for all our stakeholders. Uh, we ourselves have taken a pledge to say we will be carbon neutral uh, by 2021, which we were, and net zero by 2025, we'll impact a billion lives uh, by 2030. And there is an upsurge, which I talked in your first questions, of companies wanting help, but they are not just adequate experts that are available. So, you know, and India, we have good talent. Uh, there are a lot of programs. For example, EY has started a program internally for our people is to have masters in sustainability and analytics. So, so you know, for so basically anyone who's coming would be a chartered accountant MBA can actually do a six month masters and can actually get a certificate from a US university on this. So we are trying to train, equip, create centers of excellence and go through the entire process. So companies would need a first, you know, starting off need a maturity assessment of where they are as compared to their competitors. Materiality assessment to say which are the big areas that they can create impact. They need the GHG footprint. What is their actual footprint? A lot of companies talk about we want to be net zero by this and everything. What's their footprint uh, that they would uh, want to have? Then you have what should be your strategy and how do you actually do that? Then you have the data capture. Then you have reporting. Uh, so if you look at all these six areas, which a lot of companies are today focusing on, uh, you know, they, they, you need immense pools of talent to do this. And I think that's been one of India's strength of scaling rapidly, great way to serve around the world, quality, high quality, and at, at very affordable cost. So I think it can be a great opportunity. Sure. 
it's it's heartening to see it's it's really heartening to see what india is doing in terms of their movement towards uh, esg i mean it's a relevation what uh, some of the stories that you leader shared with us and i think we are reaching critical mass in terms of mass adoption of esg with that i'd like to thank all of you thanks for spending some time and coming out of your busy schedules uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you thank you so much thanks everybody thanks a lot vinod for doing an excellent thank session you. Thank, you. thank you thank you thanks bye well that brings us to the end of the round table titled esg as a value creator for india inc the first in a series of six round tables of the ey esg leadership dialogues i would like to take this opportunity to thank rajiv memani mahendra singhi dilip gaur sashi mukundan dipali goenka and michael holland for taking time off from their very busy schedules and joining us at this round table it was great to listen and learn from these bright minds and influential leaders who shared relevant insights on environment social and governance with the sole objective of achieving sustainability and consequently customer delight i am sure we are leaving with quite a few actionable and implementable takeaways last but not least i would like to thank vinod mahanta for doing a fantastic job of moderating this round table thank you for joining us have a good day stay safe god bless